We take this episode of The Paw Report in a couple of different directions. There's a specialized group of people that play a very important role at veterinary hospitals. On this episode, we're joined by returning guest, Dr. Krista Keller. She'll explain what vet techs do and how they assist with the daily operations at U of I's College of Veterinary Medicine. But that's not all. Stay with us. Paw Report on WEIU is supported by Rural King, America's farm and home store, livestock feed, farm equipment, pet supplies, and more. You can find your store and more information regarding Rural King at RuralKing.com. Dave's Decorating Center is a proud supporter of the Paw Report on WEIU. Dave's Decorating Center features the Mohawk Smart Strand Silk Forever Clean Carpet. Dave's Decorating Center, authorized Mohawk Color Center in Charleston. Thanks for joining us for this episode of The Paw Report. I am your host, Kelly Goodwin, and we have a returning guest on The Paw Report today, Dr. Krista Keller from the University of Illinois College of Veterinary Medicine. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. When we corresponded about our episode, um, of course, you gave me a lot of different topics to choose from, so we decided <laughs> we were going to do a smorgasbord of Paw Report topics today. And we're going to start with um, the first topic, and you said these are really the uns Unsung heroes in veterinary medicine. These are the vet techs that you work with. What, what exactly is a vet tech? Yes, I'm glad we're talking about veterinary technicians today. So I think the easiest way to explain to the public what a veterinary technician is, is to compare them in the human medical field to nurses. Nurses play lots of different roles. They can be more uh, generalists in terms of who they treat and in what sectors, um, or they can be more specialized, like you've heard of a NICU nurse before or a pediatrics nurse. Um, technicians uh, play a really similar role. They have advanced training. They're you know, trained to do all of these things with animals. They can be more generalist or they could go on to get um, specialization in something like maybe anesthesia or radiology or to work with fun species <laughs> like I work with. Um, but they, they definitely play, um, they're an important part of the veterinary healthcare team. Most of the pet owners don't necessarily all the time interact with them face to face. And so that's why I think they're these unsung heroes is that the public maybe doesn't know what role they play in their pet's healthcare. Do you have to have certain skills, you know, I think, Probably, I, I look at you and I think as a young child, you probably always knew that you wanted to go into, no? No, not me. <laughs> most veterinarians. Yes, yes, yes. want to go into veterinarians, yes. I knew medicine, but I didn't know it was veterinary medicine. Do yeah. you have to have certain, a certain skill set or um, maybe a background to, to kind of go into this field? Yeah, I think, um, you know, the skills that most technicians have are super they're super hands associated skills. They really are hands on skills um, uh, that they usually learn in tech school where they're doing, you know, they know how to place catheters into veins and catheters into urinary bladders. They know how to obtain blood and um, uh, handle animals. Think about all the different species that we work with. And some of them, um, you know, restraining a border collie is much different than restraining a chicken. You know, mm -hmm. and so even mm -hmm. just being able to be safe like that, um, knowing how to safely anesthetize all those different species, you know, um, how to um, put a breathing tube in for, uh, again, a parrot is much different than an iguana, is much different than a horse or, or whatever. So it's a lot of um, hands-on skills. I would say the vast majority of the technicians I've worked with are also amazing organizational skills. Um, most veterinary hospitals in that clinical setting are actually really run by the technicians. And I love a great technician who can run me, who says, Dr. Keller, why aren't you in room three? Like, you need to get there, or the students are waiting for you in the conference room. Where are you at, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so they're really, really good at organizational skills as well, which I need. Now, you, you <laughs> mentioned they work with you, but mm -hmm. you know, vet techs also work in a lot of other arenas too. I'm thinking, um, 
hospitals, zoos, uh, individual clinics. So there's a lot of places where they can uh, use their talents. Mm -hmm. Anywhere that there is a animal health care setting, um, uh, a, a veterinary technician will benefit that team greatly. Um, so other places outside of zoo, aquaria, which are kind of those non-traditional species they're working with, um, outside of the community practice or even our practice at the veterinary teaching hospital, um, there's, um, anim uh, there's veterinary technicians that work with animals in research. So like in a lab animal setting where they work with mice or rats and they help anesthetize those animals um, while you know, samples are being obtained for research. Um, uh, there's uh, large animal practices where veterinarians are ambulatory practice, so they drive their truck to the farms, hmm. and um, you know they might have a technician that's with them that's helping them restrain and obtain samples and run samples and you know do all the paperwork that's involved with a veterinary practice. Um, there's a lot of corporations that maybe make animal products, animal healthcare products, and um, I was just having a lovely conversation with a veterinary technician on the phone. You know, I called this corporation to talk about a product that I had been using, I had questions about, and this amazing veterinary technician picked up the phone and uh, they were so helpful that I was like, I wanna know more about your background. And it was a veterinary technician and um, this person had used their really strong clinical background um, and parlayed that into a little bit of a different aspect of a career and uh, that they could use with their technician skills, so. Is this a four-year um educational background that you would need, so requirement certifications mm -hmm. that you would need mm -hmm. um, to become a technician? Yeah, in Illinois, to be a certified veterinary technician, you have to go through a technician school. I think there are both two-year and four-year programs. Um, uh, and there's technician schools here in the state of Illinois, as well as just a whole ton of them across the United States. So there's quite a few um, technician schools or schools that have veterinary technician programs. Um, and then all of our technicians take a national board exam. So in the same way that, you know, 100 years ago after I graduated from vet school, <laughs> I took a national veterinary board exam. And then in the state of Illinois, I think they have to take uh, a, another kind of state associated exam that I haven't taken. So of course I can't comment on that that much. Mm -hmm. Um, and then another thing is that they really have to keep their certification current by doing um, uh, continuing education. So just like you want your doctor that you're seeing for, you know, your cardiologist or your neurologist to be up on, you know, what are the newest techniques in, in their field, we want our veterinary technicians to have all that um, current knowledge as well. So um, they have requirements for continuing education. They're going off to conferences and sitting through more boring lectures, I guess. I hope that not all the lectures are boring. Um, I give some of them, so I hope those ones aren't boring. Um, they're sitting through lectures. They're doing maybe some laboratories where they're learning some new techniques. Um, but it's, a, it's, it's similar to other individuals in the healthcare field. It's lifelong education and a dedication to improving your knowledge and continuing to gain knowledge through your entire career. Is it a field that is um, a growing, and is there a large need? I mean, you're a you're a veterinarian. Do you see in your arena of other colleagues that there is a, a heavy need for technicians? Yeah, hundred percent. I worked in private practice um, in a different state before coming to University of Illinois. We had a need for more technicians there. Um, now I'm in academic practice at the university. We're hiring. I talk to veterinarians all across the state and in you know surrounding states um, all the time. And usually we gab a little. We talk about the case and then we gab a little, of course. <laughs> um, and they're sharing the same sentiment that they need they need more technicians. They need uh, more skilled professionals that are there. So uh, if it's something that uh, somebody watching, it sounds interesting. Just know the field is. Is, is in need of your skills, in need of your passion. And for growing, sure. and they can yes. contact the University of Illinois, they potentially you, mm -hmm. uh, to, get, to get some more information. I'll send them in the right direction, yes. We're gonna change the direction mm. of the show just a little bit. You know, mm -hmm. technicians, they, they work with all types of animals, maybe rabbits, mm -hmm. and that's where we're gonna go now. We're gonna Love talk it. about uh, those viewers out there watching that may have um, rabbits as home pets, and something that they should be aware of, uh, of uh, vaccinations, and a virus that's mm -hmm. um, making its way uh, into um, homes and rabbits in both wild and uh, those in personal homes. So let's talk about rabbits and why vaccinations are important 
and specifically uh, this deadly virus that's making its way around. Yes, super scary. And I know whenever you say the word virus now, kind of everyone shuts down. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> so we're, absolutely. Um, but you know, our current human pandemic of COVID started uh, spring of 2020. You know, year that must not be named. What's interesting as we kind of look at the rabbits is that um, that same spring um, there was a rabbit virus that was introduced to the country as well. And so we've been having these two pandemics actually happening at the same time. And I think our human pandemic has been so all encompassing that we haven't been able to focus too much on you know the mm -hmm. rabbit pandemic but um, the virus is called rabbit hemorrhagic disease virus or RHDV. RHDV has been an important um, reason for vaccination of rabbits in Europe and Australia for many 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 years and so if you live in Europe and Australia and you have a rabbit it is definitely part of the annual recommendation you go see your veterinarian you get your you know one of your vaccines. The virus has never really been here in the United States. It's been an exotic animal disease. Um, and so we haven't had this recommendation requirement, any of that for um, a vaccine. But in spring of 2020, there was, we don't know how it came in, but um, it came into our country and it's a brand new variant of RHDV. Um, and everyone now knows what the word variant means because we've all been We're schooled in, <laughs> yes. yeah, infectious diseases. Um, but this RHDV, two is what it's called, is a lot more deadly, a lot more scary. And um, it actually has a larger number of species of rabbits that can be affected. So a lot of our wild rabbit species in the United States um, are, are dying from this virus, particularly in the southwest part of the country. There's been these awful outbreaks. And then there's been several outbreaks of pet rabbits that have also um, come down with the virus and ultimately um, died from it. Um, so in the midst of all of this, similar to the human pandemic where we then had vaccines that were created, um, there has been a vaccine that's been created against this RHDV2 variant. It is not yet FDA approved. It's going through that approval process. But while it's in that process, the federal government decided that the risk was great enough for our rabbit population that they granted this emergency use authorization for the use of this vaccine. So that emergency use authorization was exactly what happened with the first COVID vaccine. So there's a lot of similarities here. I'm sorry if I'm giving everyone flashbacks. <laughs> Um, but that authorization came in kind of October, November from the federal government in 21. Um, and then the state of Illinois also approved the use um, in late of uh, 2021. So at University of Illinois, we've been using this vaccine in monthly um, vaccine clinics that are open to the public to bring in their rabbit, have a quick exam from our students, and then receive the vaccine. Um, we've been doing that since January. Um, and I think uh, as we look at how serious this virus is, that it, it really can kill rabbits. It can kill rabbits very, very quickly. Um, and that it is kind of spreading across the country and has gone to different states very quickly that we should think about vaccination as a part of the way to prevent this disease from coming into our homes and affecting our rabbits. How close is it? has it come to Illinois mm -hmm. in your research? Yeah, we've had a couple of close calls. We've had a couple of suspect cases that have come into the hospital where animals have died very quickly um, and have had the signs of bleeding someplace um, because the rabbit hemorrhagic disease, that word hemorrhage means bleeding. And so we have um, definitely tested all of those rabbits and bunnies um, and they've all come up negative so far. So there hasn't been a case in central Illinois unless something happened very recently um, at the time of this taping. There have been cases in surrounding states though. So there was a case in Tennessee um, a couple months ago now now. Um, and what's kind of scary about it is that every time there's a case, nobody really knows where it came from. Mm. And so um, there, it can't be traced back to like, hey, this rabbit was hanging out with another rabbit, that hung out with another rabbit. We, we haven't really been able to trace it. And part of the scariness of this virus is it's very sturdy in the environment. And so one thing that we're concerned about is that if you have a backyard like mine that's filled with wild rabbits, and you walk around in your backyard and do some yard work occasionally, <laughs> you may <laughs> come in contact with that virus on the bottom of your shoes. Mm -hmm. And if you're bringing your shoes into your house, you could then track that virus into your house. So unlike some other viruses that die very quickly in the environment, this RHDV2 virus 
can live for a while in the environment. And there's a concern that if you have wild rabbit populations in your backyard, like a lot mm -hmm. of us do, that we could track that into our home with our shoes, um, maybe with a rake or, you know, something that has gone outside and come into contact with something that came into contact with right. a rabbit. Is it all within fecal matter or is it saliva? Is it airborne? Um, what more do we know mm -hmm. about the transmission of, of this yeah. virus? I don't think it's airborne. I think it truly is. It has to be something that's tracked in. Um, although that, um, that contact can be kind of microscopic contact. So it doesn't need to be rabbit touches sick rabbit. You know, it really can be um, this bowl was eaten out of by sick rabbit, and then we use this bowl and give it to healthy rabbit. And that sick rabbit maybe had some saliva or something that was in there, and now the healthy rabbit is now coming in contact with that saliva. So it is a direct contact mm -hmm. with the virus. Um, uh, but the scary thing is how sturdy the virus is in the environment, that it can really live in the environment for a while and not be, you know, immediately deactivated um, just because it saw some sunlight or something. So, Can it affect us? I mean, if I nope. touch that bowl that has been touched by an infected rabbit, do I have any effects? Nope. Luckily, that? it is not what we would call a zoonotic disease. So a zoonotic disease is an infectious disease that we can get from an animal. And this is not a zoonotic disease, so you are safe. Mm -hmm. You are mm -hmm. safe. Don't bring it to your bunny, <laughs> but you are safe. Yes. Uh, something you recommend, um, do you recommend that all those that have bunnies bring them in, be checked out, mm -hmm. get this... Um, get the vaccination just to be safe. Yeah, I think that um, the vac vaccination can definitely play a role in protecting our pet rabbits. Other things that I want um, uh, my clients to uh, really think about are to maybe not feed from food that is gathered on their property. So for instance, a lot of people will go out there, um, you know, maybe they plant garden. lettuce in their garden. Don't bring that in to your bunny and feed it to your bunny. Um, same thing, don't go forage for wild re weeds and bring that into your bunny because that's an access point that we could bring the virus into the house. I also counsel my clients to think about taking off their shoes at the front door because they're not quite sure what they've walked through and keeping the shoes maybe in a mud room or, or something else or making sure that there's a lot of separation between shoes and things that have been outside and their pet rabbit. Um, right now, I feel um, very confident about the safety of the vaccine. I've been giving it to rabbits since January because it hasn't gone through the full FDA process. I can't, I don't know exactly how efficacious it is. So although I think the vaccine is probably gonna work lovely and it's gonna be FDA approved and then we'll have access to it a lot more regularly um, and we won't have to have vaccine clinics, we can have it available for your rabbit's annual exam. Um, I think right now it has to be a tool in the toolbox because um, there's a, a little bit of unknown going on. So yeah, I think a vac vaccination is part of that protection, but it's also just trying to have like a, think about biosecurity and think about making sure your pet rabbit in the house is very, very separated from um, anything that's outdoors. All right, we're gonna change gears again. And maybe it's not rabbits uh, that, that you have at home, but maybe it's Backyard chickens, oh, you know, yes. let's see, the pun yes. between the rabbit and the mm -hmm. chicken, I don't know, I'll let you think about that. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, having backyard chickens is an up and coming kind of new, I don't know if you would call it hobby, I suppose that you would, hobby for people um, for a variety of reasons, for enjoyment, but also for a source of food. Yeah. Um, and so that's where we're going to take the interview now because you have some experience with backyard chickens, mm -hmm. you do see some of these mm -hmm. chickens, mm -hmm. you have clients that come in with chickens. Let's get into, I want to raise chickens, I want to put in a coop, and what do I need to know about doing that? So we'll start with, why do you think it is that people are so in, intrigued by having these little critters running around? Yeah, well, chickens are really fun. Um, I know it sounds like whenever I talk about animals that the, each one is my favorite animal, so I apologize. <laughs> That's just me. Um, but chickens have great personalities. They're really funny. They're easily trained. I have clients who definitely have chickens who come when you call their name, and their names are always hilarious, like Dorothy, Brenda. Um, you know, they, they're really... KFC. Uh, Casey? <laughs> yeah, the, the, fun, the really fun people call them KFC. But um, yeah, they, they come to their name, they're trained. Um, they're really engaging with each other and with the family, especially, you know, they're, they're habituated to seeing your kids and your dog and, your, you, and you. Um, so they really are lovely to be around. Um, they play with their environment. They, 
they're just really fun. So I do think a lot of my clients legitimately enjoy being around their chickens. You know, they, it, they come home and they're like, oh, Brenda needs me. It's time for her three o'clock worm. <laughs> I think this happens. The chicken ladies know right now. They're like, she's calling our name. <laughs> Um, uh, so that definitely happens. I do think that I've had clients who said that they started it up for a different reason. You know, they started the hobby for a different reason, but now they just love their chickens. Some of those different reasons, I've had clients tell me that they wanted their kids to learn responsibility. Mm. You know, hard I'll, chores. Yeah, those are hard chores. A lot of our kids these days are living in more suburban environments, but maybe when we were raised, we had more of a rural environment and mm -hmm. had more of those chores, right? right? Um, I've had clients tell me that they were really concerned about the welfare of the birds that were laying the eggs when they bought them in the store. Like they didn't know if those birds that laid those eggs were taken care of. And so it was a way for them to control kind of their food choice that they felt more comfortable. Like these birds live in the lap of luxury and they have the best foods and the best playtime. And so they, they felt better ingesting those eggs and feeding those eggs to their family. But I do think that all the, all my crazy chicken people, and I say that with a whole heart of love, <laughs> um, they really do enjoy being around their chickens. So what, how do you get started? I mean, do you start with uh, making sure that your city, village, or town has ordinances, that you can have those animals, number that's one, a good one, that's, that's most a good important, one. Yep. Uh, that you have space, and then mm -hmm. we'll go coop, and then nutrition and daily care. Yeah, I think investing in a really protective coop becomes very important. Uh, most of us are in suburban environments, especially if you're gonna have a backyard, you know, backyard flock, and there are hungry raccoons and foxes and your neighbor's cat and you know, um, flying owls and mm -hmm. you know, all of this sort of thing. And so um, uh, the uh, Brenda, who likes her three o'clock worm, uh, looks very delicious for the neighborhood fox. And these animals are very hungry and um, are, when it comes to raccoons, very smart. And so having a coop, a lot of people will home make a coop, which is fine. Um, if you have the tools and the time and the capability, go ahead. But um, it really needs to be super secure. Um, so two layers of wire that are kind of separated by wood and dig the wire down into the ground several feet. So that way, anything that's gonna try to tunnel under can't get under. Um, here in Illinois, we also have to think about, you know, that we can keep them warm enough in the winter and also have a place for them to be in shade in the summer. And so really investing in a coop that is very, very, very secure becomes really important. Um, I have had several clients tell me that they have, uh, raccoons have literally opened the lock oh, yeah, they're smart. on the door. They are too smart, too smart for their own good. So um, maybe try to let your five-year-old get into it. And if the five-year-old can't get in, <laughs> then maybe you're okay. I'm not a hungry five-year-old, a very right. hungry five-year-old. That's, right. yeah. That's right. Speaking of hungry, what do they eat? I mean, yeah. should you, do you... Um, give them certain foods mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. I think one thing that brings a lot of my chicken clients joy is that they can give their chickens lots of treats and, and food right so they lots of times will give them scraps from dinner or vegetable scraps um, and um, or they'll buy them worms or dig up worms or whatever and that's all lovely and great everyone needs some treats in their life mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. um, but because these are food producing animals you know they're laying an egg every 26 hours like that's mm. insane. Mm -hmm. And that egg has a ton of calcium and vitamins and fat and protein. And so they really do need a very high plane of nutrition. So every laying chicken should be on a formulated chicken pellet that's made for laying chickens. And that just really ensures they're not gonna have any nutritional deficiencies, that they're gonna have all of the calcium and protein and fat that's required to make a really quality egg for you and your family. Do they like to be alone or do they want to be in a flock? Oh, they want friends. Oh, they need yes, friends. They. <laughs> they need friends. You need a Brenda, a Dorothy, a, uh -huh. you know. <laughs> you, need, you need a few friends. Yes. Um, and my favorite is the are the clients who name them in swaths. So they'll be like, sure. they're all um, heavy metal rockers from the 1980s, <laughs> you know. And then they're like, this is Kiss. And oh, this nice. is yeah. Black Sabbath. And you know, roses. Like, yes, yeah. yes. It makes it Very nice. a lot more fun for me. Yeah. Uh, what about a rooster? Do mm -hmm. we need we do we need that guy mm -hmm. in our coop? Yeah, to go back to city town ordinances, a lot they're of them uh, they are very loud. So a lot of these ordinances will not allow a rooster, um, just because 
your neighbors will hate you um, sort of thing. <laughs> it's pretty loud. And even though everyone thinks it's at the crack of dawn, sometimes just in the middle of the night. Oh, so um, it's not a predictable situation with the crowing. Um, uh, but you do not need a male bird for chickens to lay eggs. Um, so, uh, so you don't really need a rooster. Um, lots of times if there is a rooster, the eggs are fertilized, um, which we all eat, like if you eat your eggs from the grocery store, they're unfertilized eggs. Um, but if they are fertilized, they look a little bit different. And so I don't think that most people actually want fertilized eggs either. Or but more you, chickens. Or, or more chickens. Yeah, usually you're like, this is all we can take. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Dr. Keller, it's so it's such a joy to have you on the Paul Report. We are out of time, oh my. Uh, but we were able to cover a lot of different fantastic topics today. Yes. So once again, we ended on a thank you for coming on the Paw Report. We look to have you again uh, next season, hopefully. I know 100%. we've got a lot more topics yes. that we can talk about. Yes. So thank you for joining us. Thank you. And thank you, our viewers, for joining us for this episode of the Paw Report. We hope you'll join us next week. I'm your host, Kelly Goodwin, and we'll see you then. Dave's Decorating Center is a proud supporter of the Paw Report on WEIU. Dave's Decorating Center features the Mohawk Smart Strand Silk Forever Clean Carpet. Dave's Decorating Center, authorized Mohawk Color Center in Charleston. The Paw Report on WEIU is supported by Rural King, America's farm and home store, livestock feed, farm equipment, pet supplies, and more. You can find your store and more information regarding Rural King at ruralking.com. Additional support for the Paw Report provided from Soggy Paws of Mattoon.